Today on Missing Link. Where's the connection between potatoes and space research? What's the connection between space travel and a dog? How do hounds and trees fit together? And what does a wood have to do with a diet? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are, you just have to look really hard. Missing Link. These are the potato's toughest enemies. They are virtually unstoppable, endangering entire crops wherever they appear. From Andean potato weevils to potato moths and more, these tiny pests can wreak enormous havoc in potato fields. The potato faces a total of 20 different pests around the world. The International Potato Center in Lima, Peru is the workplace of some 200 scientists from all over the world working for progress in global nutrition. Biologist Jürgen Kroschel has declared war on pests. His weapons of choice consist of intelligent solutions from nature itself, eliminating the need for tons of insecticides. The farmers use insecticides that they spray three to four times a year to combat this pest, the Andean potato weevil. We've been working on developing alternatives to insecticides for many years, and in the case of the Andean potato weevil, we can now safely say that the farmers will have an effective alternative to insecticides. Uh, ohne Insektizide auch die Entenrüssler zu kontrollieren. Kroschel's studies on the weevil ultimately reveal its greatest weakness. It cannot fly. This discovery is the key to a brilliant solution. Farmers can now build simple barriers around the crop to keep these pests at bay quickly and affordably. Soon, the simple procedure will also undergo field testing. The potato moth is another villain. Quite the traveler, the potato moth has expanded from the Andes to European shores. A warm weather lover, the potato moth is now a most unwelcome guest in Italy. Once the potatoes are infested, up to 70% of the entire crop is threatened. But Jürgen Kroschel has another trick up his sleeve, again thanks to Mother Nature. He creates artificial sexual bait for the moths. Attracted by the magical scent, the moths head eagerly and unknowingly to their death in the poison gel. The concept is called attract and kill. Love hurts, or in this case, kills the potato moths. Besides this, we have conventional pesticide traps. They also kill off hordes of the moths but the sex trap is the clear winner. For us it's a big success, no question. This is a huge triumph for us. The development itself, combining an insecticide and a sexual bait substance, comes from Germany. Our attempts to use it here have worked, so we're pleased now to also have this in our alternative pest control arsenal and to promote its use here in the tropics as well. Crop failures caused by pests have been a normal part of daily life here in the Andes for generations. But now a new era is emerging, the era of climate change. At an altitude of 4,000 meters, every rising degree on the thermometer has a noticeable effect. The already sparse rains evaporate faster and the soil becomes infertile. What can help farmers in such extreme regions? Researchers use greenhouses to simulate the future and its consequences for potato cultivation. Roland Scharfleitner has an idea of what this could mean. If the temperature rises in subtropical areas by only one or two degrees, then all of the farmer's efforts would be doomed. This has to be prevented. So Roland is studying potatoes in an environmental chamber to see just how resilient they are. 
We've pre-selected different varieties of potatoes, and we're growing them here. Some are resistant to drought stress and others are highly susceptible to drought stress. We conduct measurements on these plants during their growth phase to find out what makes a plant resistant to drought stress. If the ground is very dry, potato plants only form very few tubers, if any, because they're made up primarily of water. This is unacceptable for agriculture. Roland Scharfleitner's work is aimed at creating new varieties that can thrive on extremely little water. The story of human space travel is intrinsically linked with America's former space shuttle program. But what do potatoes and space exploration have in common? Even with a navigation system, there's still no guarantee you won't end up in a ditch. In order for GPS and the in-construction European navigation system Galileo to get us to our destination accurately, we need to have accurate maps of the Earth. It's one of the reasons that satellites crisscross the skies, measuring every square meter of the globe. We're brought to the startling revelation that the Earth is not round, but sort of potato-shaped. When we think of a potato in its jacket with lumps and bumps and sour cream, that's not the sort of picture we can apply to the Earth. Our Earth potato model is a design where the gravitational fields can be plotted. Or, to put it another way, we can spot the places on the Earth that are of different masses, whether covered by land or water, by the amount of gravitational attraction. So, the model might be a bit exaggerated. But there's no cause for worry. Our world is neither a potato nor is it a chip. It remains our blue planetary home in this vast, vast universe. This is NASA's Kennedy Space Center, the mecca of human space travel for a long time. Five shuttlecraft were built during the 30-year-long space shuttle program. The program was wrapped up in the summer of 2011. Despite increasingly strict safety measures, the space program remained a dangerous Houston prospect now right up to the end. Columbia, the International this Research was nowhere Mission more evident underway. than when the Columbia disaster happened in 2003. Minor damage to the heat shield during the start phase resulted in the Columbia disintegrating 16 days later when it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. While every shuttlecraft is equipped with the latest in sensors and computer monitoring for the vulnerable underside, their basic design has not changed since the 1970s. Much of the work conducted on the shuttle is still done by hand. The glass fibers, which make up the greatest part of the vitally important thermal tiles, are also manufactured by hand. The basic material is still produced here at the Kennedy Space Center the same way it has been for more than 30 years. Only the quality has improved. Manufactured quartz glass fibers were viewed as the ideal heat shield right up to the end of the program. They have a porosity level of over 90%, meaning that each tile is essentially made of air and is subsequently very lightweight. But each tile is also slightly different in shape, thickness and height. Automation is not the answer here, because all of the shuttlecraft differ slightly from one another in their dimensions. A foam rubber block serves as a sample for producing exact copies. The light glass fibre material can be damaged by as much as a fingernail, so an extra layer is added to increase the stability of the tile. So what we do is we coat them with a, a very thin layer, about the thickness of an eggshell, of a ceramic coating. It's a glass powder with boron in it, and then we actually fuse it together, center it, uh, at about 2200 degrees for 90 minutes. So as the tile is heating up, you see, the, you see how hot it's getting on the, on the surface there, but yet my hand is still at ambient temperature. I feel no heat whatsoever. Now over time, that's going to work its way through because they, although the conductivity is very low, it's eventually going to work its way through and that's why the tile, the, the structure of the vehicle, the space shuttle, is hottest when it's actually on the ground after it has time to conduct through this tile material. 
because it's very low conductance. The space shuttle reaches speeds of up to 33,000 kilometers per hour when re-entering the atmosphere. This is many times the speed of sound. During this phase, the tiles heat up to more than 1600 degrees Celsius. But if the aluminium structure covered by the heat shield gets hotter than 93 degrees Celsius, it becomes deformed. The Space Shuttle program is history now, and NASA is looking for new, safer ways to explore outer space. Where the successor to the Space Shuttle will head next, and most importantly when, remains an unanswered question for now. They're often called man's best friend, and this description couldn't be more appropriate for the seizure response dog, Angel. But what exactly is the connection between space travel and dogs? They say that a dog is man's best friend. But why is that? Because it's so loyal? Oh, could be, could be. Or because it brings us our slippers in the morning? Oh, sure. But perhaps there are a few more plausible reasons, such as dogs can do some jobs better than humans. And if someone is good at their job, it's always a good idea to keep in with them. Imagine that customs officers themselves needed to sniff around luggage. It wouldn't be long before they needed a pause. One owner of four paws and a good snout is customs officer Rover. When man set his eyes on the heavens and space travel, he decided to send his dog on ahead. Laika was the first dog in space. Launched from the Soviet Union on the 3rd of November 1957, she manned, so to speak, Sputnik 2. She was the first living thing to be thrust into space, but her flight ended tragically. There was a defect in the heat isolation of the space capsule during re-entry, causing it to overheat. Just three hours after takeoff, our space pioneer perished. Perhaps in future, dogs should choose their friends more carefully. This is Susanna Heiner and her son Christian with their dog Angel. The relaxed scenario we see here is deceptive because Christian suffers from acute epilepsy and is also mentally handicapped. Epilepsy used to dictate the lives of the Heiners, that is, until Angel showed up. I can't imagine life without Angel anymore. It's inconceivable. When I think about all we've been through, and now that Angel is here, we're relaxed and Christian and I have a sense of security. Christian doesn't need nearly as much in the way of emergency medication now. Almost none, in fact. No more hospital stays. Things have never been better for us. Angel is a seizure response dog. Golden Retrievers have a great attention span and ability to learn. That makes them an ideal breed for this job. Before Angel was assigned to Christian, the family had to monitor their son night and day. Before Angel, Before Angel he used to have a lot of seizures, at night as well. From the age of three to seven, we were with him virtually all the time in hospital. Now Angel is here guarding 18-year-old Christian. If Angel recognizes a dangerous seizure, she wakes up the parents. Angel can even relieve Christian's acute cramps by licking him, something that previously only strong medications could manage. Angel is Christian's lifesaver. Angel was only an eight-week-old puppy when she came to Christian and began her training as a seizure response dog. Christian plays with Angel frequently to maintain their close relationship. Eric Casting takes care of the training, teaching Angel to recognize every one of Christian's seizures as an important event. Then she begins to focus on the seizures, progressively perfecting her instincts so that she can sound the alarm as early as possible. Phänomen, 
Angel has already learned a lot, but her training isn't finished yet. Today we want to simulate a seizure again and see if it works. Afterwards we want to head out into town and see if Angel reacts there as well, because this is important if Christian is going to be more independent. So let's take a chair. I think that's easiest for you. You sit on the chair and we'll get out of the picture. You've got the dummy here, so we can work with it. This is a simulation training session aimed at simulating an epileptic seizure. We're doing this here in this closed room so that I can observe the results. It's been a while since I last observed these two in this type of simulation. Afterwards, we'll head out into town where there are lots of people so that we can get Angel to help out there too. The test begins. See, now he's breathing differently, deeper. She's still distracted because we're sitting here. Yes, now she's reacting. As soon as Angel notices Christian becoming restless, she reacts and gets help. Some seizure response dogs even push warning buttons to call an ambulance. Others simply bark loudly to call for help. Seizure response dogs like Angel provide an invaluable service for epilepsy sufferers and she gets better at her job every day. Angel is indeed Christian's guardian angel. Thanks to Angel, Christian and his mother have a new lease of life. The forests in this part of the world are seen as natural sanctuaries, but this ecological system is just as susceptible to human influence as any other. So how would a completely natural forest develop and what links forests with dogs? Taking in a deep breath. We all enjoy doing that on a woodland stroll. Here, the scent of wild garlic, woodruff and pine float on the breeze. For dogs, though, there's a great deal more to sniff at than trees and blades of grass. Specially trained quadrupeds are even capable of sniffing out little pests. The citrus longhorn beetle and the Asian longhorn beetle are wreaking havoc in European woodlands. And the time for playing around has ended. Now, it's Rover's turn after the tree has been found, of course. But even at two meters off the ground, these super snouts can locate the beetles. And every good sniff deserves a reward. But for the tree, it's the end of the line. Right down to the roots, it's chopped up and burnt. Rover looks on a little perplexed. After his tip, one of those nice places to lift his leg is gone. Darn it. It's just after sunrise in this clearing in Germany's Lower Franconia region. On this spring day, an unusual aircraft waits to begin a research mission. The airship's normal job is flying advertising messages. Today, however, it's helping Andreas Florin set a trap. Florin researches the treetops, also known as the forest canopy. Beautiful morning. There's very little wind above the forest. In fact, there's so little wind that pilot Ralph Kramer has his hands full steering the craft. We're too fast. Let's turn again. The airship is the only way Andreas can position his trap in the very tops of the trees. The biggest advantage of the airship is that it doesn't produce any downwash. If you came up here with a helicopter, they create so much downward wind pressure that some of the trees could even fall over. Andreas wants to find out what animals live and move about in these treetops. To do so, he has to throw out his self-built trap above one of the tallest trees so precisely that it will hang there for several days. 
If the trap slips, then we've got a problem, because if we can't reach it anymore from the air, then I'll have to climb the tree to recover it. Canopy research is still a very young discipline. The treetop environment is home to thousands of small animals. If I don't have a look at the canopy, we can't fully appreciate how the animals that live there influence the entire ecological system. The scientific world admits that it actually knows very little about how forests work as ecological systems. Part of the reason for this is probably because the animal life inhabiting the canopy has been completely ignored. As a biologist, Andreas is convinced that the canopy would be home to even more species if there were more deadwood on hand. Deadwood is usually removed from commercial forests. Andreas is conducting a long-term experiment in which he's preparing several trees to die in a few years. And so the big question is, how will the canopy's animal community change if there's more deadwood available in a forest? Forests with more deadwood are home to larger numbers of beneficial insects that combat pests. Andreas is looking for evidence of this where the protagonists live, at a dizzying height of 22 meters. Watch out, we've got too much weight here. I've got to throw down a piece of wood. Make sure no one's down there, okay? High up, on the unsteady platform, this mission is not without its risks. Andreas Florin gives the insects the raw material they need. The dead wood's now in the treetops, and over the next few days and weeks, insects will move in. They'll lay eggs that will develop and hatch next year. We'll catch some of the insects coming to settle here, as well as some of those that hatch next year in the traps that we hang here. So this trap will capture flying insects and arachnids. When they get to the plexiglass, they'll either fall into this liquid or be guided upwards into the liquid in the eclector. Andreas has essentially created a fake natural forest for the insects. Now he just has to wait and see how his research subjects react and find out which ones land in the trap. The canopy inhabitants include caterpillars, spiders and beetles, which are typical of a managed forest. The question remains as to how significantly life will continue to develop in a natural forest made up of 50% deadwood. It is possible that these small life forms have a far greater influence on the fate of the forest than has previously been assumed. Lavish meals and fatty foods. Battling calories seems futile. But nowadays, many nutritionists even praise diets with fatty foods. But what do forests have to do with diets? One woman in five is overweight and urgently needs to tackle the problem. The growth in adipose tissue is paralleled by a growth in chocolate sales. 8.2 kilograms per year is consumed by every German citizen. It ranges from Easter eggs through pralines right up to Christmas figurines. But the addiction to chocolate is under attack. Production of cocoa is falling. The enemy is a louse native to Africa that has now spread, causing the death and felling of cocoa trees across the world. Pests present problems to all kinds of trees. But it might be our chalky father Christmas that takes the hardest hit, forcing us to go on a diet. All hope is not yet lost, though. The cocoa plant genome has been mapped, and with a bit of luck, could soon be louse resistant. Who knows, perhaps next year we'll all be uh, swimming in chocolate. As for the diet, well, perhaps next. Children's Hospital, Oakland Research Institute in Berkeley, California, is called Cory for short. This is where Professor Ronald Krauss works with his university and postgraduate students conducting basic research. 
Professor Kraus is interested in the influence of genes and nutrition on the metabolism, and particularly in the role of fats. Professor Kraus is one of the most important figures in fat metabolism research. His work is responsible for discounting generalized thinking that dictates eat fat, get fat. His studies assert that the true villains in unhealthy nutrition are primarily small, low-fat particles. The share of these particles increases if an overabundance of carbohydrates is ingested. This means that we have to re-evaluate the role of fats in nutrition. Gary Taubert, an American scientific journalist, wanted to know the precise answer. A physics graduate, Gary is a man who values scientific data and facts. For years, he has examined the data situation on the topic of fat in nutrition. He wrote a provocative 2002 piece in the New York Times magazine called What if it's all been a big fat lie? He alleges in the article that there is actually no scientific basis for the dogma of fat is bad. The single biggest misconception about fat is that it's bad for you. And so we should eat low-fat diets. So we should eat, take the skin off the chicken and eat skinless chicken breasts and stay away from butter and lard. And, you know, um, that if you're eating, say, 25 or 20 percent of the calories from fat, that's healthier than a diet that has 40 or 45 or 50 percent of calories from fat. And in fact, if you actually look at the evidence, there's um, considerable reason to believe that the lower fat diets are unhealthy. That the less fat you eat, the more carbohydrates you eat. And the more carbohydrates you eat, the more insulin you secrete, the fatter you'll get, the more heart disease you'll get, the more uh, likely you'll become diabetic. Um, all of these factors, you, know, you can't say for sure this is true. Because again, the medical research establishment hasn't been paying attention to this science, but there's copious evidence out that this is likely to be true. And that the, one of the worst things you could do right now is follow the sort of general public health recommendations and eat low-fat diets. Gary Taubers loves fine food. He used to have a weight problem. But since he started eating a diet rich in fats and proteins, according to his own findings, his weight problem days are over. He loves Mediterranean cuisine with lots of vegetables, good oil and, of course, wine. He knows that the so-called French paradox already aroused controversy among researchers all the way back in the 1950s. Pretty simple. In the Mediterranean region, where agriculture is a relatively old invention, there's very low heart disease rates. And then as you get further east and further north into Scandinavia and Scotland and Ireland, you have higher and higher heart disease rates because um, agriculture and you know eating grains and starches are newer to them. So they haven't had the time to adopt that the Mediterraneans have had. I don't know if it's true or not, but it explains the observations. This means that the French paradox is an even earlier indicator that the fat is bad dogma simply doesn't hold water. On the contrary, the observations conducted by these researchers indicate that far from being the cause of our dietary problems, fat is in fact part of the solution, and a very tasty part of that. 